Welcome to the Concordia Publishing House podcast, where we consider everything in the light of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm your host, Elizabeth Pittman. All we have to do these days is turn on the television, the radio, open up social media, and it's not unusual for us to see people sniping back and forth at each other. I'm right, you're wrong. My opinion's the only one that matters. And if you don't listen to me, well, you know what? You're canceled. I'm so glad that we're able to welcome our friend, Pastor Ted Daring, back to the podcast today. We're going to talk about how we can reclaim kindness. Hi, Ted. Hey, good to be back. Glad to see you. Now, before we jump into making the world a happier, nicer, or friendlier place, which I know you have all the answers for that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm glad. One-stop shop. We're good to go. Exactly. I knew this was going to be a magic bullet. Mm -hmm. How have... You're down in Texas, Mm -hmm. and Texas has been in the news quite a lot lately, and I know you've been right in the thick of things. Tell us a little bit about what you've experienced and how you're doing. Yeah, so uh, last week was... uh, And we found this out middle of the week that the storm had a name which was Winter Storm Yuri, uh, straight from, you know, up north in the Yukon. But it was it was Sunday night. We have, um, our house was built in 2014, I think. So a newer house. But in our neighborhood, they put in, it's an all-electric, there's no gas plumbed. And so uh, our entire neighborhood has these um, gas or uh, um, heat pump, AC systems, which basically is there's no furnace. It's, you know, supposed to be this great, you know, economic way to do it. The problem is from about uh, 30 degrees and under and a certain humidity level, it just gives up and says, I'm out. Glad we could do this. And so our heater stopped working Sunday night and we started to get a little worried, but we're like, oh, we'll be okay. You know, we've got some space heaters. Uh, And then it started getting colder and colder. And then we hit these rolling blackouts that they had announced through that night. And then about eight o'clock Monday morning, we were without power from 8 a.m. to uh, 8 a.m. Monday to about 11, 15 a.m. on Thursday. And having lived in St. Louis uh, for seminary, I, you know, grew up in Texas, grew up in Houston area, but living in St. Louis, you know, this is okay. This is cold, but it's not insane. But the the big things that were against us is, you know, no snow plows, uh, sand for grip, no, you know, ice melt, nothing like that. And so the the road infrastructure here is not built for this. Right. And it started over the weekend. We had a major ice storm, which came in then to this huge dip in temperature um, through the week. And so we ended up, we toughed it out Monday night when we got down into single digits here in central Texas, because we were like, we don't want to leave. If our pipes bust, we want to be here. And then about, we were going into in and out of our cars to both warm up and charge our phones because we were without electricity. Our cellular internet service was horrible. So we're like calling friends and family to go, what's going on? What's the latest announcement? Like, we just don't know what's going on. I'm calling and texting everyone from church. I feel bad because I miss some people because I had no access to my lists. Right. I'm literally just scrolling my phone going, okay, I'm just going to call and text, call and text. And then um, we were camp. We took our camp stove out back. That's how we were cooking and you know, all this stuff. And then uh, Tuesday night, my wife had, you know, we had two hot spots, which was either our cars or upstairs in bed. And she came out while I was charging phones and she came out in her car, backed out. And um, I was like, called her because, you know, I'm not getting out of my car to (laughs) to go knock on the window. Um, And she goes, yeah, I just couldn't get warm. And we had a little meat thermometer in our room and it was 44 degrees at about five o'clock. And so her parents across town had power. And so then from about 515 to about 630, we packed everything we thought we needed. We're going around making sure things are going. She gets on the phone. She had enough like service to get Facebook and find a, a plumber in our neighborhood Facebook group who's in the neighborhood who was like, I can give you the steps. She DM'd him, got his number, called him. He walks me through shutting off the water from our street side, which, you know, I should have known as a homeowner long ago. 
Um, and I successfully first shut off our neighbor's water. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm running the water inside trying to drain the pipes. I'm like, I didn't shut off our water. Luckily, he wanted his shut off, but didn't know how to do it. So that was good. Very neighborly of you. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking of him. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, finally figured it out, you know, got it all done. Um, called this guy back for the final steps. And we find out that he, he my wife had Facebook friend him, goes, oh, we share a friend. It's this guy ends up being the DCE at a church 20 minutes from us an LCMS church just around the corner. And so it was like this moment of God being like, listen, I've got, got you. This. Like you're, you're covered. Yeah. So we ended up going to her parents' house where there was a fireplace and electricity and we ate comfort foods for three days and hung out with her parents and, you know, spent the time just touching base with folks in church. And uh, the truth is we were blessed. We have a newer house, good insulation, uh, a new style of piping that's not, you know, copper, which is much more likely to break. And so we were okay. It was very anxious ridden in the midst of it, but we're going to come out on the other side. We, our water was back, you know, we controlled it the whole time. We never lost it. Um, but as people are talking, it's, it's hard to, um, or, or we need to not forget that there are a lot of people who uh, either socioeconomically or just based on you know, what year their house was built are not in the same boat we are. And so I know um, in our communities, but especially uh, as you travel a little further south from us into Austin, there's still a lot of people without food, without um, water, although I think the boil notices stopped today. But it, it um, when people were talking about it, I mean, it was, it was, it was a real deal where it was like, you know, Monday we thought we're going to be in these rolling blackouts and, you know, every, you know, we're going to lose power for 15, they were saying 15 to 45 minutes. And then they were like, yeah, if you don't have power now, you're not getting it back. And we were at, you know, 75 hours is kind of what we figured out wow. total. So a little over three days, but we had friends that it was like six days, no power. Um, and a lot of uh, churches, I know at least um, one of the, we have a pretty big ecumenical group of pastors here and they've all been, you know, how's your building doing all that stuff. And um, one of the, one of the guys who leads that they had a pipe burst above their sanctuary. Uh, I know there are a couple other LCMS churches in the Texas district, that similar kind of thing where it's like, if that pipe busts, you're not, cause no, you couldn't get on the road. There was a quarter right. of inch of ice everywhere. Well, um, ice, ice is so dangerous. And mm -hmm. as you, as you mentioned, most of Texas, especially where you are, is not built for this. It no. just, you're, no. it's, it's so uncommon that this is not something that, your your infrastructure is wired oh, yeah. to deal with. Yeah, hit us hit us with 115 degree heat, and you know we're just going to sit outside in the water sprinkler, and you know we'll be fine. But you know it was as as all of that dropped, and what's crazy about it is it was contained to a week. It's done now. We're I mean it's 70 degrees outside. We've got the heaters off. Like it's brilliant. <laughs> but for this, you know, from a Saturday until. I mean, it was almost seven days. It was, we got that ice storm Friday night and then we really melted out um, Saturday, the following Saturday. But it's, uh, uh, I was talking with a friend and it was a lot of those things you count on were gone. The basics of, you know, power, water, uh, you know, those, those things. But then um, we had some failures in government where it was just kind of like, people were gone. We, we didn't see anyone. We were blessed in our community here where we are, that, that we have a really good local government and they were very, um, you know, very much communicating as much as they could, but there were some other places where that was just not there. So you had, you know, those failures you had, um, you weren't able to communicate because internet was down. I mean, it was looking back, you go, Oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought. But like in the moment, I, like I was, I was until about yesterday evening. I just felt like I'm just going to sleep a little more. <laughs> like I'm just I'm just go nap. Well, you don't you don't know how long it's going to last, so there's the uncertainty, no. which is causes unease mm -hmm. and the fear. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I was thinking about it with friends, and we have a lot of friends down in Texas who were in the same boat as you. Yeah, and some of them have kids. I mean, you have a dog. And I, I thought about like, if it were me there, if it were us and my kids trying to figure out what you would do, 
it would be very mm-hmm. unnerving. We had friends who um, had under one year old or right at one year old and they within kind of four or five hours of losing power, they were like, we're going to, you know, we're going to find a hotel and they, they were in a hotel and um, you know, theirs was the one year old plus their dog, plus the dog, they were dog sitting. <laughs> oh my. Um, yeah. So that was, uh, you know, and, and my buddy Ben, the dad was, he's like, yeah, I was taking work calls in the bathroom of our hotel room because like, that's what I had to do. And it, it was surreal. I mean, we we're checking in with everyone every day. Uh, we learned a lot about pipes and how to check them and how to mend them. And uh, the the really cool thing on the other side of it, I was talking to my dad, who's down in Houston, and he has been through all the major hurricanes lately. And, and our community has been hit. The community I grew up in north of Houston was hit um, not only by Harvey, but then some major floods um, two and three years after it. And so dad has, has been in those places of they would have teams just ready to go. And, you know, we we're kind of prepping that thing. But what's really cool with this is whereas with a, a hurricane, you know, an entire community gets flooded. And so it's like, okay, if you're part of the community didn't, then you're helping because, right. you know, entire streets, entire neighborhoods. But with this, it was kind of like, you know, some Houses had pipes burst, some didn't. So what was really neat was to watch neighborhoods come together. My my dad in Houston had um, a pipe bust over his garage. And so he was happy it was in the garage and mom was home. So they shut the water off. He runs home from church and, um, you know, fixes it. But when he had gone to the hardware store he had bought, he was like, I'm going to buy four pipe caps just in case. And sure enough, two houses down his street both had this exact same pipe burst. Oh, and so wow. dad spent the afternoon just helping these folks repair their pipes. And, and that's kind of the cool story to come out of this is uh, our neighborhood Facebook group was literally people going, how do I shut my pot water off? And, you know, people hopping in and saying, doing this, or, Hey, do you need a shop vac? I've got one. We had someone who after it was done, but like grocery shelves were bare said, Hey, I had a friend drop all this stuff off. I only need this just run by the house if you need eggs or milk or, you know, whatever. And, yeah. and that was that, that's the cool side coming out of it, that there's that there's, you know, professional sports teams are just out buying water and meals and all these things to give away. Um, so in the midst of watching all that, it's really cool to watch the communities come together and say, Hey, if everyone else is gone, like we're going to take care of each other. And that well, was really neat. There's some really wonderful stories of kindness and compassion coming out of mm-hmm. this. And mm-hmm. to see those is so encouraging. And it, it it's the best of the human spirit, right? Yeah. And I, I know that through all of this, it was such a stressful time and tensions were high. And I saw in news reports and then some online conversations, people weren't so kind. And, you know, there there were comments about certain, you know, government officials and the way certain things were handled. And then even when it comes down to, oh, you Southerners, surely you can just, you know, man up and take it from our Northern friends, which that's not helpful. And that's what I think we're going to dive into today is, you know, being Christians, we're not immune to this behavior, whether that's in a one-on-one conversation, whether it's online, whether it's how we interact with a seemingly faceless brand Mm -hmm. um, in our communications. So tell us a little bit about this, that while we might want to have the argument, and I think it's natural for people to dig their heels in and say, I'm right. right." Mm -hmm. Tell us where the real truth is in all of this. Yeah. So there's, there's this vein that runs through Christianity that I think as with a lot of things can have aspects of truth of saying, Hey, we want to make sure we don't give ground on the truth of scripture. You know, we we want to say, Hey, this is, this is what the word of God says. Uh, The way we talk about it a lot at our church is we say, listen, we, um, yeah, we do a little bit of interpreting scripture of learning those kinds of things, but really scripture interprets us that it reflects, it shines the light, it shows us, um, you know, those those uses of the law of, of, you know, how we failed, how we need a savior, 
you know, who we're created to be and all of those things. And what can happen, and I think it, it comes out of this place in our culture of, if I can prove you wrong and prove myself right, there's this twofold like, um, well, then I, I've proved it and it's true, but also I can allay my insecurities because of it. And so what ends up happening a lot of times is in whatever it is, our political opinions, our scriptural outlooks, I mean, just interpersonal relationships. And what often happens is we go, well, I, I want to win. I want to be in charge. And so I don't think we ever start being like, I want to be unkind. Right. But what happens is we go, I, I want to be right can quickly override. And, you know, we're, we live now in a time where being right is a few keystrokes away. Where you look and you go, I can immediately look up any kind of information. I can, when was the last time we just said, well, I guess we'll never know. Like when you're in an argument, I, I think of um, with my wife and I, a lot of times it's, oh, who, you know, what actor was this or what, you know, sports figure or what date or is that how, and well, you just Google it. And the funny thing is in our house, it works kind of two ways of uh, if you're the one who thinks you're right and you Google it and you're wrong, you just kind of close your phone and pretend like the conversation isn't <laughs> happening. But I'm, I'm but, sure Chelsea uh, really lets you get away with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She lets that one slide. <laughs> um, no, but what often happens is that instead of being understanding and empathetic, and especially I'll, you know, I'll speak from being a Christian. What, what happens is our witness becomes this attacking spirit. And for me lately, it's been fascinating. There's kind of this genre building of uh, podcasts and vlogs and stuff. That's the faith deconstruction that it's people who have gained some kind of following on social media, on YouTube, and they grew up as Christians and now they've kind of grown out of it. And so they do this podcast, YouTube video about here's my faith. Here's what I've learned. And here's where I go. And, and I've seen, there've been a couple bigger name YouTubers, especially who've done this. And I've seen people react and in anger and frustration and, zero kindness and basically go, well, you're leading children to hell now because these kids follow you on these social media platforms and, and they attack the people. And that's, you know, this one, this one area where it happens, but it, it it's happened in our politics in the last, you know, I would even say eight years it's happened in our understanding of the world and how we steward the environment. Um, it happens even in just conversations with friends and neighbors and family members. And what often can, can happen is that we look and we go, well, if I'm going to be right, it doesn't matter how I say it. I'm just going to be right. And it's this old idea of we break down. It's like, well, being right is greater than being relational. And, I think as Lutherans, what we can look and say is like, hey, there's tension there. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm only relational to the point of saying, I'm not going to talk to you about anything that I hold of value. Well, yeah, you've, you've let something go. You need to look at that. But if you let completely go of relationship to be like, well, you know, how does it feel to be wrong? We lose that. Well, and when we... We've forgotten the playground adage, you know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But mm -hmm. when people, and it happens all the time, I've seen this even on conversations that pop up on our social accounts and people are, they say things. And I, I truly hope that you, you want to think the best of people. And I was raised right. that you treat people like you want to be treated. And you really hope that this keyboard courage is almost something that they're not recognizing how harsh it sounds when they're typing it. I think I'm probably wrong on that. I'm probably, it's probably some wishful thinking in many cases, <laughs> but these comments that come when they, you know, they're driving 
their point home and they use harsh language, it, it doesn't foster conversation. It doesn't build relationship. If anything, it alienates right. and it, it drives people further and further apart. And it, at the end of the day, it's not helpful. And you lose the opportunity to communicate your message when you've taken that tone. Well, and, and we've, in American Christianity at the very least, we have taken the idea that being right is greater than, like I said earlier, it's greater than relationship. And there are a couple scriptural things that jump out to me. And, and the first one is, you look at Jesus sends out the 72 in, in Luke 10. And you know, go out. And one of the things I love in there is that he says, you know, if you come across, um, you know, knock on these doors. And if you come across a person of peace, stay there. And, you know, a person of peace is someone who we could all kind of figure out in our lives, someone who's, who's open to us, who's, you know, wants to, wants to be welcoming, wants to be hospitable. You know, we keep interacting with those kinds of things. And, Sometimes a person of peace may be those things, but even in the relationship, you may hold differing ideas. Right. And, and I love though the sending of the 72. It's like, stay, like, don't leave, be with these people. Right. And in fact, Jesus says, and if they don't listen to you, don't try and argue more. Just be like, all right, I'm good. Like I'll, because it may not be your job to be there. And then, the other part of that, though, is, is looking at, it, if we look at, if the spirit is at work in our lives, then we will show its fruit. And the fruit of the spirit, and this is, it bugs me so much because when I was a kid, I always thought of it as the fruits of the spirit. Like, and so it's like, I'm doing okay in this one, but I'm low in this one, got to grow in that one. But it's literally the fruit. So singular, it's, you, you know, you get to the Greek and it's, singular the fruit of the spirit so it's like listen if you're not showing up in one of them you got to look at all of them and one of one of those is is kindness and we have taken this idea that says uh i don't i don't need to be kind if i'm right and i think that's wrong I mean, I here it is in scripture and kindness shows up all over the place. And we go, well, if I'm right, it doesn't matter. And it's like, that's that's not what scripture says. Like scripture well, says this matters. And we can we can be right. We can disagree. Mm -hmm. But even if we disagree, if we try and we're all capable of this, we can find some sort of common ground for us mm -hmm. to start a conversation and speaking the truth in love, you know, not yep. alienate the person that we're talking to as we're going about it. And I think if I, we, th go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I heard someone put it this way the other day. Um, we were talking about something and they said, you know, I would much rather spend time with someone I disagree with things on who has proven their character to me than be around people I we agree about everything, but their character is broken. And and you know we and, and we can get into the sinfulness. We're all gonna sin, we're all gonna but but there's something there that I think the Christian church needs to look at to say we advertise ourselves and, and not in like a marketing sense, but as as Christians we say, oh yeah, we we love all people. We welcome, you know, all people. We, you know, do these things. And then what we broadcast is, well, if, and then we add in all these, these layers and what it does to us and not only our witness and how we are viewed by other people, but I think there is a spiritual dynamic in us that oftentimes this, this discussion about how we interact with people is always outward facing and, and it can go two ways of saying, well, either I'm right and I got to prove it or, you know, it breaks down witness and relationship and connection. 
But I think there's also an inward place where it says, okay, if I'm not in the fruit of the Spirit, well, that shows that I'm unrepentant of something. I'm, I'm walking away from the ways of God. So, and so I, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, so I think you're headed where, where I am. What are a few of the things that we can do mm-hmm. to take stock of our own behavior and start to reclaim kindness in the way that we approach our relationships and our everyday conversations? I think foundationally, like number one is coming back to a gospel identity that says, Every breath I take, when when I'm asleep, when my feet hit the floor in the morning, and everything in between, who I am is a child of God. And if we can, and that's that identity and that knowledge of that identity, like that identity can never be taken away, but the knowledge of that identity is what the enemy is constantly trying to chip away. And I think when we when we start looking elsewhere in terms of identity we start having these cracks in our own insecurities and those kinds of things. And if someone says something I vehemently disagree with, it's much better for me. I can respond so much better when I remember, Hey, my, my foundation is secure. Whether this person agrees with me or not, that doesn't change who Jesus is in my life. It doesn't change who I am. So I think that's gotta be the first part as we come back and we go, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Chief. Well, chief of sinners, though, I'd be as yeah, I yeah. jump in and, and talk over you. Um, sorry about that. But that's to, what makes it a podcast. On, I know this is true. To build on that, we've talked about this on the show before with other guests. One, we have to remember that our identity is secure. But that other person that we're talking to was created with a purpose by God just mm-hmm. as much as we are. Yeah. And for that that matter alone, they have value. And that should also inform how we are treating them in our, our conversations. Yeah. I think it's easy for us. And this is another, I think, tactic of the enemy is to make an us versus them. And I say this because you're looking at them, right? Like, and, and it's, sometimes it's really intense stuff and sometimes it's foolish stuff like how I might feel about the New York Yankees. Like, I mean, it's, it's, and it's everything in between though. I mean, it can be as foolish as that. Baseball Twitter has taught me a lot. That the Cardinals are the best. Listen, listen, (laughs) you can say that and I'll react kindly, but I would disagree. We can disagree. We can disagree respectfully. I will say the Cardinals made some great off season moves. Yes. We've got Yachty Um, back, so we're in good shape. (laughs) <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's, it's small, it's big, it's important, it's silly. And, and so if we can take a step back and take a breath and go, why it, self-reflection is key. It's saying yeah. like, why am I, why am I reacting like this? Like someone else can react differently than us. I can't change them. I can only change me. So can I take a step back and say, why am I getting worked up? And this happens in, uh, you know, my marriage, my teammate at church, the guy I hired to be, you know, my right hand man is my brother. And so you want to talk about, oh yeah. And I know what to push right back. (laughs) And so I've learned a lot about communication and this is a healthy Christian, like brotherly relationship. And we have to like slow down and return to these places. And I think for us, kindness is about saying, if I know who my Savior is, if I know the depths of his love for me, maybe I can love people a little bit deeper. And maybe I can let go and say, my job is not to change everyone's opinion. My job is, is to stand up, but, but not to be, I don't have to right every wrong. Right. And it's it's interesting because I think kindness actually, and this is the ways of Jesus end up, you know, that, you know, my, my burden is easy. My yoke is light. And so often we all feel those heavy burdens of, oh, I'm a Christian. I have to, and I think sometimes in kindness and gentleness, God is giving us a chance to be like, you don't have to fix that. Right. 
And I mean, core to our theology is saying the spirit changes people. We don't. We may so, never see, we may never see the results of something that the spirit exactly. does for. Exactly. And I, 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 th- I think it's easy for us to confuse kindness with weakness. Mm-hmm. That- and I think there's a thread in American Christianity that also has been like, and I saw it pop up the other day. Someone tried to take the meek shall inherit the earth and tried to twist that to be like, well, it's not talking about real meekness. And I'm like, bro, I don't, I don't think you can get around that one. Like that's Jesus <laughs> saying that. And, and there's this, this fear that we will be weak or we, and I just want to be like, listen, our, our savior, our King was despised and rejected. And he, one of the few like earthly promises he makes us is the servant is not greater than the master. Um, And, you know, here's his example of forgiving and healing and, well, it goes back to our identity again. Mm-hmm. We're not weak because he is strong. We start singing the kids' Bible songs. Right. But, right. but he's our strength. And mm-hmm. that can't be taken away from us. As right. I mean, we, that that is something that we can rest secure in. And and I think when we when we rest in that, it also gives us the space to look and say, we don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And I love somewhere along the lines when I was in college, I heard someone um, talk about learning to be the chief repenter. And I think so often it's easy for us to get caught up in, if I have to be right, then I can't show my weakness. Right. And we've seen it happening with a lot of kind of this weird Christian celebrity thing that's happened in our country where people just bury things deeper and deeper and deeper because they go, well, I can't be wrong as opposed to could you imagine what it would the witness it would be if you could you know you let it fly on facebook and then 20 minutes later you come back and go hey i'm going to leave this comment up but i need everybody to know i'm an idiot like i said this in anger and in frustration i'm not perfect i've worded it entirely wrong like and i've seen some people do that and i go that's powerful well, it's more powerful than erasing it and pretending that it never happened. Right, right. And that, again, is trying to sweep our sins under the rug mm-hmm. and hide them from everyone else. How can our lack of kindness, how should we view that as a warning sign of something deeper? Yeah, I I love, uh, this has been part of my own personal spiritual growth, is looking and saying, for a long time, I looked at sin and falling short as, you know, oh, woe is me. Like I was the pastor's kid and everything. And so it's like, I needed to be perfect. Grace was for everyone else. I had to earn it. But what I've started learning more and more is I don't want sin in my life, but I know, you know, that what I don't want to do, I do. But if we can look at it as a symptom and say, okay, when I get a, you know, when I start sneezing a lot, I know you know, Central Texas is trying to destroy me via allergies. And so it's as simple as waking up in the morning and taking my allergy pill. And you know what? There are days that it's three o'clock in the afternoon and I'm blowing my nose, but the allergy pills upstairs and Chelsea, my wife looks at me and goes, go take your (laughs) pill. And so if we look at unkindness, um, if we look at, uh, bullheadedness, if we look at, you know, keyboard warrior on social media, if we look at those things and we start going, um, these are, these are symptoms. And the, the, the solve to this is not, I need to be better. That's, that's where we get mixed up as we go. I just need to be better. Cause then we start going, I need to be better. And then God will love me more. And we start going down this weird works righteousness path. What if we woke up in the morning and we, you know, we dove into scripture, we started in prayer and, you know, that, that allergy pill is not saving me, but what it's doing is it's, you know, destroying the symptoms and it's going, okay, if I can come back and say, when I am acting that way, I need to look at spiritually, where am I? And physically, where am I? Because it could be 
something where you go, there's, man, there's a sin I'm unrepentant of and it's chewing me up inside. And I just need to go to a friend, a pastor, a DCE, a teacher, you know, my spiritual mentor, uh, you know, a close friend in the faith and just say, listen, scripture says when I confess this, it's beneficial, it's forgiven. So I need to confess this, you know, but it could be something, you know, we can't separate the body and spirit. Sometimes it's like the sin of being unrestful. Right. And it's in our household growing up, the joke was dad would look at us and go, Al, take a nap. Because, you know, he's Al. So <laughs> the joke was, you know, dad, take a nap. I'll take a nap. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, I'm tired and I should shut my mouth. <laughs> and that maybe in the creation of me, I can't separate my physical and my spiritual. They're so interwoven. And, and as a created being, that's what I'm supposed to be. So maybe I need to go for a walk and just, you know, get some endorphins because that's that's how God created me. Maybe I do need to go sleep for 20 minutes and just kind of catch back up. And, and so I think for me, it's looking and identifying and learning when we start seeing the symptoms that we start identifying, I need to rest in my identity. I need to come back and I need to say, there's grace enough for me. And I keep learning to come back and refresh. It's it's good to be self-aware to do that. And I've caught myself plenty of times where I've snapped at somebody in my family or at a coworker and I've caught myself and I've said, let me back up. Sorry about that. It's not what you did. This is all on me. And I need to remove myself from the situation for a while and reset. And mm -hmm. so when we can be self-aware, it, it, it's pretty powerful when you can recognize how we can change things. Um, yeah. the things that we can control, um, mm -hmm. in our spheres. What about, so we all have our spheres of influence for some, it might be you, as you're a pastor of a church, it could be with coworkers, friends, it could be with an online community. So we've, we've talked about looking inward and how we can kind of think about kindness in our own lives. How can we set that example for the people that we have influence over to help Maybe we're seeing some unkind behavior happening. Maybe there's, it's so obvious. How can, to help bring people along without you're being unkind. How dare you? We need to, you need to go repent yeah. with, with, without mm -hmm. like, falling prey to the hole. Yeah. And, and I think part of this is, again, we're going to, we're going to see people and we're going to see Christians who are unkind. And we have to realize that our job is not to correct all of them. You know, there, there will be people we need to correct, but we can't control everybody. Um, we can't control really anyone, but we have these, you know, this is the body of Christ at work that we see examples and we see uh, calling each other out in love, you know, those kinds of things. I think of, you know, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And this is, this is a discipleship thing is that, you know, we, we all have people who are discipling us in the faith. And then we all should be looking to say, who am, who am I discipling in the faith? And it's this give and take, and it's, it's all along the road. And we need to be aware to say, I need to invite people along in my life to see this at work. And it's to be smart enough to go, uh, number one, I'm watching people in the faith. So that means there are people watching me. And sometimes it's it's just being kind in front of people you know who are watching. And that's that sounds contrived, but I don't think it is because sometimes we have to, you have to use training wheels before right. you're riding the bike. And for me, for a long time, I was like, oh, I feel like I'm going to be that, you know, this guy's faking it, but it's, it's, it's not that as much as it's saying you have people who are older in the faith, people who are younger in the faith, but we're all walking this path together. And so it's just showing that kindness where you are. Um, a very simple one is, you know, we have all these different, um, uh, we talk about, you know, time, talent, treasure, those kinds of things. We have these things we can give away. And when you look at time, talent and treasure in terms of, 
how can I use those for kindness? You want to show someone kindness over tip. Like when you can and you're able to, like I get that that's a money thing and some people aren't able to do that. But if you can, tip someone when they don't deserve it. Like that's a kindness they won't quickly forget. Um, You know, spend time with people that we're in this weird celebrity culture. And one thing I've noticed is I've read some of these stories of the breakdown is like, church leaders and pastors who start separating themselves out. Like you can't, you can't be with everybody. Like that's just impossible, but like spend time with people and not like, here's my ministry time, but like. Well, that's what I love at the, at the top of the show. You mentioned how you were calling people from your congregation, like every day you were going through mm-hmm. your list and that, that intentionality, they're not going to forget that you reached out to them and you checked on them. Well, and the key is I'm not good at that. Like that's <laughs> not, I'm good at relational, like you're with me, we're hanging out. I'm yeah. great at that. Me calling you up is is not my strong suit. Mine either. And, <laughs> and, and I think that's sometimes we just have to look like some things, you know, I think about about like working out and stuff. Like I've, I've got a lot of weight to lose. I got those kinds of things. And there are things I do working out that like I grew up playing sports and doing those kinds of things. And there are certain things that I just love. And it's like, oh, yeah. This is easy. This is fun. And then I look at like cardio and I'm like, I hate it. (laughs) I have to do it, but I hate it. And I think that is one of those things that you look and you say, in terms of kindness, there will be things that feel unnatural, but they're just going to feel unnatural until you keep doing them. And so for me, it was looking and saying like, it was honestly, it was the example of my dad, who's a pastor and him, you know, his process in the midst of um, emergencies of hurricanes of these kinds of things. And I'm like, I need to call my people. And I wanted to check in on them. Yeah. You know, so if any of my congregation is listening, don't think I did this like for brownie points or anything. Like (laughs) I wanted to know where you guys were, but there was so much example for me set of right. different pastors and church leaders who over the years have done that and checked in. And I think kindness sometimes will be organic and will be the simplest thing where we look at someone and go, you know, someone's crying, someone's lost someone they love. Like kindness is very simple and easy, but sometimes but it requires it, us. It requires us to look up, right? right? We have to look right. up and look around us mm-hmm. and see, recognize when these people in our midst right. at his place there are hurting and could use a little bit of kindness because if God has put them in our path, he's probably equipped us to help. Yeah. And, and it's, it's one of those places that I find myself. The older I get, the more I learn about, I had this idea of like the supernatural Christian person. And, and what I keep learning more and more is like, it's so much simpler than that. I don't have to create this like supreme, you know, super Christian. It's like, it, and and for me, part of it was my neighbors too. So I've got uh, BJ who lives uh, on one side and Mike and Tammy on the other. And in the midst of this storm, it was just checking in with them. It was going, how you doing? What you got? You know, what's going on? Do you need us to take care of anything? You know, them checking in on me. And I think that's something that in the day and age of social media, when I can stay in touch with everyone I've ever known to slow down and go, can I get to know the people physically around me? And that I think kindness is sometimes easier in a local community than it is in an electronic one. And that's not to like destroy an electronic community or anything like that, but it's it's harder to be harsh to someone when you're talking to them face to face than when you're behind a keyboard and a monitor. Right. Yeah. So as we start to wrap up, you've said a couple of things that I'm going to set you up. You've mentioned discipleship, you've mentioned simple. What can <laughs> what can we expect? What can our listeners expect to see along those topics coming from you later this summer? Here's the funny thing. I had no intention of actually setting this up. 
but here we I, are. I know you didn't, but you did without meaning to, and I just happened to pick up on it. So I'm going to give Perfect. you the opportunity for your elevator speech. So I think coming out, I, I want to say it's in June or July. It's June. Uh, June is, uh, I wrote my second book for CPH, which was, it was a real interesting time to write a book in the middle of COVID and shutdowns and that's what uh, all of our to, authors have said who have books coming out in this first part of this year. If you uh, ever want to have a deep discussion about imposter syndrome, um, we can talk about the summer and writing a book in the midst of COVID. But what I've learned over the years is, and there's kind of these waves in the church, and it revolves around three things. It's worship, discipleship, and mission. And it's like one of those things is a hot topic at different points. Right. And what I realized through people who discipled me growing up, um, people who are still discipling me, people I'm learning to disciple is saying, you know, for us at our church and what I end up doing in this book is saying, well, disciple is just someone who trusts the promises of Jesus and seeks to follow him. It's that simple. We create all kinds of layers and complications and it's just about slowing down and going today. How am I trusting Jesus? How am I seeking him? How am I following him? That's it. And then I wrote, you know, 200 pages on it. So real simple. But <laughs> but it really it really is. It's it's for me what I wanted was something that I could, you know, and I kind of cheated cuz this is what I want to hand to my church to be like, let's do discipleship together. Let's talk about discipleship as as a core of who we are and it incorporates worship, Bible study, missions to say, listen, the life of a disciple rotates around all those three things and it's being in balance. It's not going, you know, it's all about this or it's all about that. Or it's, it's about saying, Hey, those, those promises are given to me, you know, in worship in community. Uh, you know, I seek the Lord around people. I'm not on my own and I follow him because of what he did for me. And so for me, this, this kindness aspect is something that I think comes through a little bit in the book is looking and saying, you know, as disciples, we're not always going the right direction. You know, we're because of alliteration, we're fickle and foolish. We're just like the Israelites. We like to think we're different, but we're not. It's like something new comes along and we're like, you know, oh, that's shiny. And you know, that there we go. Right? Yeah. And so in the midst of all of this, I wanted to be able to hand to my church and my, my hope is that it will bless other churches. Something that's like, listen, you, you don't need um, to vastly change a lot of things. You just need to look at them through a new light and to say, I'm not going to separate my life from the rest of this. You know, worship is not some compartment. Bible study is not a compartment. My life at work is not some compartment, but instead if we can kind of open up and say, no, my whole life, is is the life of discipleship and that what I what I learn and what I'm given in worship changes and it's I mean it's your dad it's stuck in my brain <laughs> is him just you know well what does this mean for me on Monday yep and just stuck in there is saying hey like let's let's not separate these things and so kindness becomes a part of that discipleship process that you know, some of us are going to get it. Some of us aren't. Some of us are going to have to learn more than others. Uh, my problem, I I really value people who can just like look at something, read it and go, here we go. I have to fail at it about 40 times before I start going, oh, maybe, maybe this is what the Lord's doing with this. And so, you know, this book just takes those simple ideas and says, how do we execute them? It, execute isn't the right word. How, how do we look at that as just a simple life change? How do we do it together? And, and so the end of each chapter has, it's built around like, hey, are, are you discipling people? We'll bring them together around this book. And it feels kind of like questions, but it's like, listen, these, these questions, you're going to be asking them for the rest of your life. This isn't like, you did it, you know, you finished the right. chapter, check mark, you're done. Well, we don't, we don't end our life of discipleship, at least right. until we're called home. Right. It's, it's going to be an ongoing thing. And so to get us in the rhythm of this isn't a program that we go on, go to at Sundays after late service for an hour, but it's a mm -hmm. full, full it's way of thinking. Yeah. It is. It is. Well, I'm excited yeah. for the book. 
It releases on June fifteenth. There it so is. That's that's there the it day. Is. There's the day. I got it on the calendar, and our listeners, you'll be hearing more from Ted about this book as we get closer to that date. Um, but in the meantime, we'll link to Ted's podcast so that if you want to hear more from Ted in your ears while you're going about your day, Ted and his buddy Tanner uh, do a podcast. We do um, a podcast. We do a podcast. I'll also link to the blog post Ted wrote that was the inspiration for this whole conversation. Um, you wrote it a few years ago, but it actually holds up really, really well. And I think it, it's, it's great that we were able to have some time to kind of refresh what kindness looks like in our daily lives. So thank you for being with us today. Glad I could be here. It's been fun. Listeners, we'll catch you next time. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Concordia Publishing House podcast. I pray that this time was valuable to your walk with Christ. We'd love to connect with listeners on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Concordia Pub. Visit cph.org for more resources to grow deeper in the gospel.